reasons that we've seen the link associated with the gut and a lot of different problems in our body. So, you know, if I can just kind of get a handle as I get started where everybody's coming from, um, are you concerned about yourself or somebody else? And, um, okay. okay, for most of you about yourself. Uh, are any of you on medication for uh, a gut dysfunction? No, okay, you are. Um, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, something along those lines? I'm actually waiting on colonoscopy results. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Move forward just a little for me if you don't mind. I'm gonna be really tight here. <laughs> all right. Well, what we're going to talk about is a non-drug treatment to IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, Crohn's disease. And what we're going to really talk about is where some of these different conditions are similar and where they are different. We'll talk about two fields of study that uh, I'm involved with. One is called functional medicine, and two is called functional neurology. Um, if I can get a, uh, <coughs> you know, kind of a, an understanding, again, where everyone is coming from, those of you who have a gut problem, have you gone through the traditional medical system trying to find solutions and are still kind of looking? Yeah. As it stands right now, um, my stepdad was just diagnosed, my mom's husband, and um, we are doing two ranges of medicine. We're going through the medical treatment, the IV treatment at the hospital, and at the same time we're also trying acupuncture and we've tried some homeopathic medicine too. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. It may be a little easier than that. And, and that's, that's a key thing to keep in mind is, is where we talk about, you know, a lot of these managements that are out there. The traditional medical approach is designed to find a diagnosis and then come up with either a drug or a surgery that can treat that diagnosis. The biggest the, problem that we found is pain management. Sure. Is that all the ulcers, because this went on for over five weeks before he ever got any answers, and I don't... Well, we don't feel like narcotics is always the answer. So that's what they feel like. You know, they give him that to help him feel better so that he doesn't have pain whenever he's having all these sure. excessive bowel movements. And then he's scared to eat because yeah. of the excessive. So it's like there's a catch-22 no matter where you turn. So I want you to start thinking as we go forward over the next hour, why does he have pain? And, and second to that, you know, is there something that can be done to help kind of correct that the gut dysfunction without going to drugs and you know, where is it coming from again it didn't come because somebody is on Liotta it didn't come because of one medication or another medication there's something that is driving that dysfunction and, and you know we're gonna really touch on that tonight but there are a lot of options that are out there some of them are very simple some of them may be a little bit more involved and in treating someone even you know somebody who's in chronic pain because of, of uh, some sort of inflammatory bowel disease um, you know, I am a chiropractor, and I like to talk about this because people, I had a patient earlier today, why, you're a chiropractor, why are you talking about thyroid dysfunction? Why are you talking about gut dysfunction? It's not as far off base as you may think, though. You know, chiropractic, you think traditionally back or neck, but the reality is chiropractic is about whole health, and it's really, you know, a non-drug alternative for getting your body to work the way it's supposed to. Specifically with me, I'm involved in two programs. One is through the CARIC Institute, it is a diplomate in chiropractic neurology. The other program that I am almost completed with is uh, from the American Board of Clinical Nutrition. And this is uh, one that uh, really rings true to my functional medicine patients. It's a 300 hour program that is available to MDs, DOs, osteopaths, and DCs, doctors of chiropractic. And I am 26 hours shy of sitting for the diplomate exam for that. That's 300 hours in clinical nutrition on the doctorate level that really has taught me everything that I need to know relating to functional medicine and alternative management of all these different problems. I've studied under a couple key doctors, Dr. Datis Karazian, who is the number one thyroid expert in the world. He wrote the book, Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms When All My Lab Tests Are Normal? Dr. Mike Johnson, who is a chiropractic neurologist and head of a very large group of doctors based out of Wisconsin, um, as well as uh, Dr. Joe Diduro, who uh, is a fellow in the uh, Neuropathy Treatment Centers of America, which is an organization that treats peripheral neuropathy. And, you know, all these different managements uh, really have set me up to be able to treat, again, you know, are we dealing with chronic pain? Are we dealing with gut dysfunction? Where is the problem coming from? 
Can everybody see this okay? Are you, you guys okay over here? When we talk about IBS, what we really have to talk about is chronic health. And what we're really looking at is a wide range of different health conditions have some really common threads. Again, I mentioned that we treat diabetes, we treat thyroid dysfunction, Crohn's disease, type 2 diabetes specifically, celiac, in, uh, and again, if we look at fibromyalgia, you can look at vertigo, sciatica, chronic fatigue syndrome, peripheral neuropathy, ADD, ADHD. Uh, you can look at PCOS or infertility. Uh, you can look at stenosis. You can look at chronic pain, other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. You know, all these different things, they've got some common things that, that are all involved, you know, some common threads. First and foremost, they all have metabolic imbalances. And this really hits true for IBS. We're looking at first, you know, there's an anemia that's going on. The anemia means red blood cell disorder. Uh, disorder. So don't necessarily think iron when you think of anemia, but just think that there's something wrong with your body transporting nutrients where it needs to. Can you make it a little warmer in here? It'll warm up pretty quickly. <laughs> Thyroid dysfunction. Almost every chronic health problem has a thyroid issue. The thyroid gland supports almost everything. It really does. You're going to have blood sugar problems. Whether it's too high or too low, it's not going to regulate properly. You're going to have adrenal gland dysfunction. Your adrenals are your stress hormone. They make cortisol, they make DHEA, epinephrine, norepinephrine. If any of you have a sleep problem, cortisol is something you have to test because cortisol sets your sleep cycle. That's very important. There could be hormonal imbalances. There could be autoimmune attacks. You're going to have, you know, again, these immune imbalances that could cause the body to attack itself. You could have infections. Especially, I mean, for you guys, this is a big one. You talk about gut infections. Have they tested you for H. pylori? Have they tested you for parasites? We'll talk about that a little closer. But that's a big area that we look at. We talk about food sensitivities. This is another huge, huge area. And I'm going to talk a lot about the traditional celiac test that's done and what testing is now available and why the traditional tests, if you've had them done, come back negative. You know, and, and that's especially, you've got, you know, if we just talk on that for a second, from a food sensitivity point of view, you've got the allergy testing where they do IgE testing and they maybe even do the skin scratch tests. And, you know, those tests were basically, found, I think it was about three years ago, um, they published that they were 50% valid. So 50% of the time, a false was going to be true and a true was going to be false which basically said those tests are not valid. You cannot use them to identify food sensitivities. But yet, they're still the most common tests that are used. They're called ALCAT, and it's a really common test. Uh, Alpha-gliadin is the other test that's commonly used for celiac specifically. And, and again, we'll get into that one in a little bit more detail, but we talk about food sensitivities. And with IBS, with gut dysfunction, that's probably the number one thing that we can identify and find and correct. Now, you also have oxygen issues. Now, this is important because our body needs fuel. It needs oxygen. You're going to get oxygen into the cells, and that's going to allow everything to function the way it needs to. You're going to have decreased oxygen. You're going to lead to decreased circulation and increased inflammation. So all these different things are going to break down, and they're going to cause all these different immune imbalances. When you have these problems metabolically, you're going to have an issue with your brain. So a lot of times we see neurological issues where your brain does not fire the way it needs to, and when we talk about some of these, you know, IBS conditions specifically, we can talk about where dysfunction comes from. Now, when we talk about metabolism, it's a big word, and, you know, we've all heard of it, but we don't all understand exactly what it means. In the easiest concept, metabolism means you eat food and it gets turned into energy. With metabolic dysfunction, there's a problem with getting that food turned into energy. When that happens, we lose the ability to have proper function. Now, 30% of that energy goes to what system? What do you guys think? The endo digestive, you think? Okay, how about anyone else? Another guess? Hmm? Okay, how about you? Actually, the answer is the nervous system, the brain. And this is important for a couple key reasons. We need a proper functioning gut for good metabolism. So if we have IBS, we're not going to be able to digest food. We're not going to have the right amount of energy getting converted. But we need good energy for a well-functioning brain. And there's something called the gut-brain connection. This is really key. Um, it even goes back to you know, Hippocrates, you know, the father of medicine. 
look to the gut, there you will find all your answers, you know, almost every human on us. When we talk about gut inflammation, what we're really talking about is, you know, some sort of an immune reaction that we, uh, whether we eat something, whether we have an infection, and it, it causes our body to kind of turn on us, and it starts attacking us. And then that creates what are called these inflammatory cytokines, basically inflammation, okay? That inflammation can lead to a condition called leaky gut. Now, leaky gut syndrome is also called intestinal permeability. And over the past five years, it's gone from a, we don't really know much about it, to rock solid evidence that it exists and that it describes a lot of the other conditions that are out there. When we get that leaky gut, you basically get fissures in, or breakdowns in your inflammation, in, excuse me, in your intestinal lining. And that leads to more food sensitivities. And if, I mean, you may know people, uh, I see patients in here who, you know, they're, they're sensitive to 20 different things. It seems like no matter what they eat, even lettuce, they have bowel movements, you know, and it's, I'm eating lettuce, you know, why am I having a problem with that? It's because of these leaky gut issues where the body is so inflamed, the gut is so inflamed, nothing can get digested properly. When that happens, what ends up happening are these immune cells, these cytokines, cross into the bloodstream. They go out of the gut and they go into the blood. From there, they can go everywhere, including the blood-brain barrier. Now, we have four barrier systems in our body, our skin, our lungs, our gut, and our blood-brain barrier. If you have IBS, you probably have a barrier system issue with your gut, you know, where it's not working right. Again, a lot of people I see will have an issue with the gut. We kind of, you know, call it leaky gut, okay? And they'll have an issue with their brain. We can call that leaky brain. You know, and then, you know, it's, it's not really leaking, don't worry. But uh, what we're dealing with is these barrier systems are breaking down. I even see people who have, it, they itch, or they have histamine reactions. And, and you know, may know, that maybe you, you may know somebody where that occurs, and it's because it's a barrier system that breaks down. And again, you know, the body is kind of indiscriminate with that. So what happens is you get this blood-brain barrier issue that occurs, and then it's going to go to the brain, it's going to cause inflammation, and that inflammation is going to cause gut problems again. Now, I told you 30% of energy from what you eat goes to the brain. 80% of our brain controls our gut. I mean, the, you know, it's uh, the, really, I mean, we talk about immune control, our immune system. And, you know, the majority, the biggest immune cells in our body is our gastrointestinal tract. And so much of that, you know, the control comes from our central nervous system. So if we have a problem in one area, it's going to lead to a problem in the other area. And it's going to be this vicious cycle. Anything that can cause an immune dysfunction. We talked about diverticuli and what causes that. Anything that can cause your immune system to attack in your gut can trigger inflammation. It could be food sensitivities, it could be infections, bacterial infections, parasites, mold, fungus, yeast, viruses. How about what we call dysbiosis, which is an undergrowth of good bacteria. Anybody here have problems with uh, energy fatigue? Mm, sure, sure. 30% of our daily energy need comes from that gut. So I said 30% of energy, right? Okay. Our bacteria may, our good bacteria, you know, you think about probiotics, you know, it's, oh, go on, Jim was saying earlier, go on a probiotic, right? Probiotics make vitamins. They make nutrients. They make the building blocks that our body needs for energy. 30% of that. And they also make something called short chain fatty acids, which also are a key <laughs> part of that. So, you know, if you have a breakdown, you don't have enough good bacteria, then yeah, you're going to have energy issues. You know, your body's not going to work the way it needs to. So we're talking about this inflammation. Your immune system produces these cytokines. It's going to go to your gut and cause inflammation, where it's then going to go to the brain and cause inflammation there. 90% of our brain cells are actually immune cells. They're called microglial cells. And this is important because, again, we don't really correlate brain function with gut function that often. When we have problems with our microglial or brain cells, Again, that leaky gut can lead to it. These immune responses can lead to it. You're going to have inflammation in your brain. That's not good. A little Homer Simpson thing for you guys. <laughs> Nobody watches The Simpsons here, I guess. <laughs> when we talk about IBS and Crohn's, it's very, very important for us to keep in mind this whole brain-gut connection because both cause similar gut symptoms. I mean, they're, they're pretty close, but... And it can be systemic. I mean, you can have an issue with Crohn's, an issue with IBS. That, that affects not just the gut, but you can have, you know, 
cold hands or feet. You can have arthritis. You can have uh, you know, brain fog. You can have all these different issues that develop. But the causes of both of these conditions, and even colitis, are very, very different. You know, with IBS, again, you're going to see abdominal pain, sense of fullness, gas, bloating, reflux. And you're going to have constipation, then diarrhea, or can alternate. You, know, you can have one or the other, the people who have IBS who only have constipation. Same thing with diarrhea, same things where they get both. And it's in, in the classic IBS is, you know, it always fluctuates and you don't know what you're doing, what you're eating, but it's occurring. And those symptoms can be better one day and then, well, they came back. So you don't even think, you know, is there something I ate? What, and you can never pinpoint what it is. Usually you get relief after a bowel movement. And, uh, you know, what, like 18%, one sixth of, of the American population has this condition. It's very, very common. Shoot, all you have to do is look and see you know, Pepto-Bismol, and I mean, you know, you're thinking, you know, Tums. I mean, how many, you know, they, they recommend Tums now for calcium because everybody takes it, you know, that you're going to get your calcium that way. It is so common. It's the number one reason why people go to a gastroenterologist. And the diagnosis for IBS is by exclusion. They can't find anything else wrong with you, so they give you this label. You typically see IBS associates with depression, with anxiety. You also see headaches chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic muscle pain or fibromyalgia. The reason for that is because, again, this gut-brain connection. You know, as the gut breaks down, it's going to cause the brain to react poorly, and that's going to create these symptoms. Again, for medical appointment uh, treatment, somebody mentioned uh, Lyauda earlier. Um, the common medical treatments, you're going to look at you know, these medications that slow down your sympathetic nervous system. You're going to look at medications for diarrhea, you're going to look at medications for pain or depression, constipation symptoms. I mean, you know, the typical management is you have this symptom, let's treat the symptom, or we'll try to calm down your nervous system. Sympathetics and parasympathetics, do we all, are we all comfortable with, with you know, it's, it's a fight or flight response or feed or breathe. It's the two halves of our autonomic nervous system. It's kind of the nervous system that we don't really have control over. When they treat IBS, they're treating the symptoms and not that underlying cause. So, you know, when we look at what causes IBS, infections, again, that is huge. Again, bacterial, fungal, yeast, parasitic, viral infections. We see, um, you know, if you guys eat sushi, okay? So think raw fish, think parasites. If you go swimming in Lake Norman, think parasites. If you go swimming in a swimming pool, think parasites, okay? I mean, parasites are very common. And a lot of times the only symptom that people notice is fatigue, you're tired but you've got a bug. And the problem with that is if you have that bug, you need to find it, you need to find it accurately, and you need to get rid of it. You're gonna have problems with your gut flora. Again, that good and bad bacteria, and that, you know, that gut immune system is not working the way it's supposed to. And you're gonna see this sympathetic nervous system, this autonomic nervous system is overactive. It specifically breaks down in a part of our brain called the brain stem. And what happens is the brain stem, specifically the mesencephalon, has a connection with the gut. So the brain starts overfiring. And when it overfires, you develop symptoms. So again, you know, the brain starts overfiring because the brain is a sensory organ. You know, everything in our body is perceived by the brain. You know, where you are in space, what you're doing, everything. So basically your body, it's, it's a big receptor. I mean, imagine, you know, You've got you know, just a parabolic mic, and, and that's your body, and everything's going to the brain. The brain needs to function because it gets all this constant input. Everything goes, you know, so it knows, again, where you are. And, and it gets input from what are called receptors. And it gets fuel from glucose, blood sugar, okay, and oxygen. Again, we talked about low oxygen earlier with a lot of chronic problems. Anemia, again, red blood cell disorder, one of the things we look at in CBC is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin transports oxygen. So if we have a problem, if we have anemia, we're going to have a problem getting oxygen to the brain or to other parts of the body. Receptors are everywhere. Again, your muscles, your joints, your skin, your eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Any idea what two receptors light up uh, the brain the most? I'll put a guess. No? We're going to do touch and gravity. Okay, so if we think about this, the two strongest receptors in our body are gravity being able to stand and touch. When we really talk about this, it's important because we want to see, well, what causes the brain to 
to get overstimulated. I'm going to talk just real briefly about how the brain actually works when we talk about, you know, get this inflammation and it affects the brain. We have three main parts of the brain. We have what's called the cerebellum. We have what's called the upper brain, and that can consist of uh, the cerebrum is the main name, but we could be the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, all these different lobes of the brain. And then we have something called the brain stem. What happens is input goes to the cerebellum, and then from the cerebellum, it's going to go to the opposite side of the brain. So if you have a signal, you've heard of right brain, left brain, right? If you have a signal that goes into your right cerebellum, it's going to go to your left brain. And then from there, it's going to go to the brain stem. That brain stem is going to either inhibit or speed up the, uh, the brain signal. Specifically in the brain stem, we're talking about an area called the mesencephalon, and that's our sympathetic nervous system. So again, with IBS, some of the medications they use try to calm down that sympathetic nervous system. You know, you don't want to see it firing properly. That mesencephalon, that brain stem, is kind of like our brake, and it tells our body when it's had enough. You know, if any of you have ever had a massage or gone to a chiropractor and been sore afterwards, and I see this especially with fibromyalgia patients, uh, it could be anything, you know, the lightest stimulation, and they're so, so in pain. You know, it's, well, what'd you do? Well, somebody just, you know, just, just rub my shoulders for a second and it hurts. It's because this break isn't working right. The, the brain stem is malfunctioning and it's creating these chronic conditions. Now, I'm talking to you about an overfiring brain because the sympathetic nervous system can lead to chronic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, UTIs, fibromyalgia, headaches. How about poor posture? If you ever see, you know, big, you know, kind of Bigfoot, you know, the guy's working out and they're always like this, their brain is overfiring. That's what's happening. And it's leading to their posture getting stuck in that position. Adrenal gland stimulation. Again, think cortisol, think sleep problems, think stress problems. How about blurred vision? How about sweating? How about difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep? Dizziness and vertigo. I mean, you get the idea. Heart palpitations, that's another big one. And we talk about, you know, heart palpitations, are they coming from, is it a thyroid problem? Is it a cardiovascular problem? It could be a brain problem. Cold hands and feet. You know, sensitivities to light, sound. I mean, these things all come because the brain overfires. The question is, why is the brain overfiring? You know, and, and we really look at, you know, different stressors that cause fewer nerve impulses. We look at chemical stressors, we look at physical, we look at emotional, and it causes the brain basically to be overstimulated. It wears itself out. So when we talk about chemical or physical stressors, we're talking about all those metabolic things. Anemia, blood sugar, food sensitivities, immune system imbalances. We're talking about poor diet. That's a huge, that's a huge one. Thyroid dysfunction. We're talking about drugs, prescription or non-prescription, chronic inflammation, infections, you know, all these different metabolic problems create these imbalances in your nervous system and they add that stress to the brain which shuts everything down. Emotional stress, again, that's a big one, anxiety, depression, you know, your ability to handle what the world throws at you. The adrenal gland is a big part of that. We talk about cortisol imbalances. You talk about how cortisol helps blood sugar get brought into the cells, so this whole insulin issue. You know, and, and you can see cholesterol problems derived from this as well. So high insulin and glucose levels, you know, it can cause your brain to be overfiring. In fact, when I see people who have brain fog, who have depression, who have a lot of neurotransmitter supports, they're on an antidepressant, they're on an anticonvulsant, we look at blood sugar, we look at cortisol, we look at hormones. That's where that dysfunction is coming from. And of course, the metabolic disorders. You know, again, when we talk about these brain imbalances, you know, it, it's always the area that we have to look. And, and with all of you, we talk about where that gut dysfunction is coming from. Is it coming because of food sensitivities? Is it coming because cortisol is putting stress on the gut? You know, how do we know? You know, that's, that's the question. You've, you've had all these tests done. Proper testing helps tell us. So have you all had blood work done before? Yeah, okay. Have they ever told you your labs were normal? Yeah. You don't realize this, but, you know, I, I use uh, LabCorp, I use Quest, I use the same labs that, that all, all of our other uh, allopaths do in the area. And when I get a lab back, they have a reference range on it. That reference range has nothing to do with where you should be. 
You know, it's, it's important for us to keep this in mind. It's, a re it's statistics. It's two standard deviations away from everybody who's had that test done. I like using TSH as the example for this. So uh, TSH is a thyroid test. It's the number one test that's used to identify thyroid dysfunction. LabCorp says the range should be 0.4 to 4.5, okay? What that means is everybody who's had TSH done in this area is between 0.4 and 4.5. That's all it means. It doesn't have anything to do with where you should be. And if we really think about, well, who gets blood work done on a frequent basis? It's not healthy people. You may go every three years, you know, maybe never, depending on, you know, if you go to the doctor or not, right? But if you're sick, you may go every month, every 45 days, every 60 days. So it's statistics based on a sick population. And it's a bell curve. So in functional medicine, we actually use functional lab values. They're more sensitive. If we talk about TSH specifically, you know, the functional range is going to be right here. The lab range is going to be way out here and way out here. Now, when you were told your lab tests were normal, what they were really telling you was, I don't see an H or an L. There's no high or low next to your labs. And the unfortunate reality of our current medical system is you've got five to eight minutes to get in and see a patient. And that's the first time you're looking at those labs. It's the first time that you're knowing what to do with the patient and you have to figure everything out in that time frame so your primary care doctor can get on to the next patient and still have his practice. If he doesn't see an H or an L, he's not gonna worry about it. When we look at functional ranges, there are areas that they may look normal, but they're not. Your dysfunction falls in those areas. Going back to TSH, the lab range, again, we talked about 0.3 or 0.4 to 4.5. Actually, that's outdated. I need to update that to the new lab core range. But the functional range is 1.8 to 3.0. It's a much narrower range. Now, this is important because that range was actually established by 14,000 endocrinologists, the Endocrine Society. But they don't use it because they don't have time to use it. They have to look for an H or an L, and that's all they can deal with. If we look at cholesterol, that's another good example. We talk about normal labs. We think anything above 200 is bad, right? We think anything below 150, you know, it's, 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 well, we don't always think about that one. We think if it's under 200, we're good. And some of you may have said, hey, you know what? My cholesterol is 130. It's so low. That's really not good. That's not. Because you know what cholesterol actually does in your body? It turns into hormones. It turns into estrogen. It turns into testosterone turns into progesterone, turns into cortisol. So if you don't have cholesterol, you can't make hormones that your body needs. You know, the normal range, again, is 150 to 200. And if you're below that, it points towards decreased lipid metabolism. Your body's not making what it needs. If we look at glucose, blood sugar. Now, if you see anybody who is in the, in the functional range, it's 65 to 100. So if you talk to somebody who has a blood sugar of 65, you know any hypoglycemics? Yeah, they're not walking, they're not talking to you. I mean, they are shaking, lightheaded, dizzy. They're sick, but it's normal. So does that make sense? I mean, when we talk about a functional range versus a lab range, there is definitely a difference. And what we want to look at with your lab tests are where are they functionally? You know, where are the numbers that they should be in? So when we sit down and we look at a history, we say, okay, here's what tests we may want to look at from a functional perspective. We do a complete blood chemistry panel. We're going to look at tests like your thyroid. And we're not just gonna run two or three tests, but we're gonna run 10 markers on your thyroid. We're gonna look at hemoglobin A1C, which is a three month diabetes test. We're gonna look at LDH, lactose dehydrogenase, which is both a liver and a blood sugar marker that never gets run because, you know, again, it, it, from a liver point of view, it's one of the secondary markers, but for reactive hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, it's a huge marker because if it's low, then that tells me immediately we have a blood sugar problem. It's probably one of the best tests that's out there. How about your lipids? Again, cholesterol, you know, is it high? Is it low? You know, if you're on a statin, are you on a statin because you're really at risk of a heart attack or stroke? Or are you on a statin because some number was a little out of the range that it, it probably should have been in or probably wasn't even a big deal, right? I mean, it's, we're way over medicated. We really are. We want to look at saliva testing. We do a hormone test. Saliva is how we look at adrenals, it's how we look at female and male hormones, and that's important because we look at the free fractional hormone. You know, if, if these hormones are in blood, then they're going to be what's bound to protein, and it's not going to tell me what your body's actually making. It's going to tell me what's being sent around in, in reserve. So we want to look at the free fractional 
Saliva is the most accurate way to do that. And we do a stool test to look for infections. This is important because, again, if you have poor gut flora, I look at, I think it's 12 different bacterial levels that we have in our body, the most common bacterial levels. And I can actually see where are you compared to where you should be. You know, and you know what, you may not have any infections, but your good predominant bacteria that makes all that energy and vitamins are really low. So that tells us what we're dealing with. We look to see if you have an infection. We do, we look to see if you've got the parasite or fungal growth, you know, what's going on. The test I use is by a lab called Metametrics. It's out of Atlanta, Georgia, and it is a hundred times more sensitive than the best tests that our gastroenterologists have available locally. It uses DNA analysis and it gives us the results that we need. If it comes back with no infection, there's no infection. And, and it's the only test that I trust because I see too many false negatives when we do the traditional test locally. I use a lab called Cerex Labs. This lab is very, very important because it was founded by the number one immunologist in the world. Has anybody here heard of uh, Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori? Mm -hmm. It's a big bacterial infection that leads to ulcers. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vajani, uh, the director of this lab, is the one who uh, first identified the antibodies to H. pylori. And he's been around a while. He was involved in the original IgE injections for you know, allergies. His lab is really cutting edge. And they have a couple key tests that we can identify. Number one, leaky gut. So they have a test that looks for literally the immune response in your gut if you have leaky gut syndrome. For anybody with IBS, this is a must because if you have those antibodies, then it tells us you have leaky gut and it tells us what we have to do to help correct it. We have food sensitivity testing available with us. The gluten test that they do, I talked about um, earlier something called alpha gliadin, which is the, tra it's the traditional gluten test that they do for celiac. Gluten is made up of uh, gliadin and glutenin. And then there's all these subparts of it. So when we think of gluten, we're thinking wheat, okay? <clears throat> if we look at what actually makes up the gluten molecule, you've got alpha, beta, gamma, gliadin. You've got gluteomorphin. You've got proteinorphin. You've got, you know, all these different components, transglutaminous, uh, that make up the gluten itself. So if alpha came back negative, it doesn't mean that you're not sensitive to gamma, gliadin, to wheat, to gluteomorphin, and proteinorphin itself. So the key thing is too many false negatives. Uh, the largest study that was done on gluten sensitivity, and we all have heard about gluten sensitivity. It's on the rise. Everybody's talking about it. Yeah. There was a study that was done at an Air Force base. Um, I forget if it's, I think it's Ohio. They took 15,000 active duty personnel and they compared them from like 1950 to 1990. And what they found was a huge, huge increase in the diagnosis of celiac disease. The real thing with this test was they didn't have access to new tests. To new tests. They didn't have access to any new way to detect it. They just found that more people had celiac disease in 1990 than in 1960. And this is, I mean, this is really groundbreaking. It's published, it's in the medical research. It's one of the best studies that you can pull about this topic. And what it basically said was, look, we have an increase in gluten sensitivity in our country, but it's not because of we're diagnosing it more. There's something that's actually changing with gluten, with, with the wheat itself. Even with the way it's made? That's part of it, yeah. yeah it's, it's, Well, in processed food is a whole other issue, and, and yes, that is horrible. Gluten is, so let's go a step backwards. Let's take wheat. So you look at a wheat field, okay? Wheat comes from a seed. That seed is, you know, has gluten in it. What they have done over the past 50 years, these, you know, these big agricultural conglomerates, is they've taken that seed and they've made it more water-soluble. It's called deamidation. And they've changed it. Literally, they've cha genetically changed the seeds themselves so they can make more of them and so they can use it better in agricultural and, and then food manufacturing. And that change has not been duplicated in Europe. It's not been duplicated in Canada. It's not been duplicated in other countries. And so literally what we're seeing is gluten sensitivity is on the rise in our country. And I see people that I diagnose with the gluten sensitivity or with celiac disease every day, and they can go to Italy and they can probably eat their pasta. I mean, it's that big of a difference. That's so funny because I was gonna try a test today um, some English cereal that was wheat mm -hmm. that I used to eat when I was a child and I didn't have these problems.
book. Yeah. I tried today. And funny enough, my stomach has been okay. Now, if you have an inflammatory cascade, if you've got this gut inflammation, mm -hmm. sometimes that has to be fully healed before you can even eat something that you're not sensitive to. But, but you're right. I mean, there's a key difference. The yeah. Because it's, it's manufactured in England. Well, yeah, it's sure. British. I mean, well, you're right. And I went and I said, oh, let me try this because the other doctor has me gluten free. Yeah. And I bought it with hesitation because I yeah. was like, I'm not to do that. The, it. Listen, the only way to know for sure if, you have, if, if it's safe for you to eat gluten anywhere is to look at the gene, the HLA DQB1 gene, and see if you have the gene for gluten sensitivity. If you do, then it's a genetic issue which means you want to avoid all gluten completely. If you don't have the gene, then yes, there's a good chance that it's based on what kind of gluten you're eating. But you have to heal that sensitivity. You have to heal that gut. And it can take six to nine months to get gluten out of your system completely. Mm -hmm. It can take, you know, three months to a lifetime to fully heal leaky gut, depending on, you know, if, if we can get you healed and we got to keep you that way, we got to keep your diet going the right way, or it can flare back up. That could be a flare-up, it may not, you know, but there's, there's key tests that you want to do to make sure it's safe to try something like that. But, but you're on the right path. There's definitely a difference. Well, I wanted to I mean, yeah. try it, yeah, because I was of, like, I used to eat this when I was younger, and it was, you know, so, you know, I found the exact British. Listen, one of, my, one of my colleagues practices in Sarasota, Florida. He's Canadian. Him and his wife went back up, uh, I guess it was last fall, to, uh, you know, go back home, check everybody out, and, and he's gluten-sensitive. He... he he knows it. He gets grumpy. He gets GI issues. He has the, the neurological issues. Everything affects him really bad. We sell a product called Gluten Flam. He also carries it. It basically gives you the enzymes to allow you to digest gluten. So he brought his bottle. I figured I'm going to have to use it, but he's going to his fish and chips place. He's going to the bar. He's going to have fun because he's going back home, right? He had fish and chips three times. And now we're thinking batter, okay? So the batter has a gluten. That's what's getting us. He had not one reaction. None. Yes, even across the border in Canada, there's a difference. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's key. Now, we need to look and see, not just do you have gluten sensitivity or leaky gut, but do you have autoimmune diseases? So we look at tissue transglutaminous, okay? TTG is uh, an autoimmune disease that actually comes about from foods in our gut. So if we see antibodies to that, it's an important test marker for us. We want to look and see a test called GAD65. Uh, GAD65 is a marker for diabetes. So these markers we actually test on our gluten panel to look and see. Um, the American Psychological Association, you know, all of our psychologists in the world, or in the country I guess, they have labeled gluten sensitivity a neurological disorder. I mean, it, it is that prevalent in what it does, how it affects the brain. It really, really does. So we want to see if gluten is an issue, how big of an issue is it with you? Is it affecting your nervous system? Is it causing thyroid dysfunction? I can tell you just two little things. It's not really you know, on the topic tonight, but if you're hypothyroid, research that's been published by the Endocrine Society, again, all the endocrinologists, says that 90% of hypothyroidism is autoimmune in nature. And an autoimmune hypothyroid would be something called Hashimoto's. I can tell you every single study that's been done with Hashimoto's, and they've got some large studies, says that if you remove gluten out of the diet, Hashimoto's improves. The antibodies improve. So again, if you have thyroid problem, then you probably have a gluten problem. And I've already told you that if you have a gut problem, you probably have a thyroid problem. I mean, this, again, gluten's a big issue for all of you. It really is. And it may not be the only issue. Cerex came out with a new panel, uh, Ray 4, that's called cross-reactivity. And what Dr. Ari and the researchers have identified is that 13 foods cross-react in the body with gluten. What that means is the amino acids, the proteins are so similar to gluten that if you eat that food, your body thinks you're eating gluten. Those foods include coffee. They include rye, barley. Those are easy because they typically have gluten in them. It also includes dairy. That's a big one. I mean, you know, we talk about that. We talk about um, there are a few other smaller markers on there that, uh, and again, we have a panel that looks for those. It also looks at 11 other sensitivities that people deal with. Um, things like potatoes, corn, uh, rice, quinoa, buckwheat. So all these things, because you think gluten-free, well, what are you going to eat? You're going to eat quinoa, rice, buckwheat. You're going to eat all these other foods. For some people, they have a sensitivity to those as well. So we want to identify that and figure out, you know, what is it safe for you to eat? For every single one of you, I can't emphasize, it can be as simple as just figuring out what foods are okay. We figure that out, you change your diet, and so many of your symptoms can go away. Now, for a bunch of you, there could be more involved. You know, again, 
You could have that brain imbalance. If that does, you have to treat it. To get the brain firing the right way, you have to get the immune system firing the right way. Everything communicates together. Now, our brain, specifically our cerebellum, which is really the part of the brain that we're talking about, needs two things to function properly. It needs fuel in the form of glucose and oxygen, and it needs activation. You know that whole concept, if you don't use it, you lose it. Okay, we're talking brain exercises, we're talking activation. We use oxygen in our practice, and we have these concerts that looks just like this. Jim, a couple of you guys see them around here. What they do is they give fuel to our cerebellum. The cerebellum in our brain is the most oxygen-dependent part of our body. More than any other tissue, it needs oxygen. And we talked about how if the cerebellum is misfiring, it leads to this whole cascade of IBS. So we give patients oxygen. Now we have what's called a pulse oximeter. They use them in the hospital. And it's how you check to see what your oxygen levels are. And what we see is a lot of people have oxygen in their body, but they're not using it. It's called perfusion. And the perfusion levels are very low in people because they have this decreased metabolic function, decreased ability to use oxygen. You know, as we age, you know, and, and again, if we don't have oxygen, we lead to disease. So when we talk about brain-based therapies and, and you know, metabolic treatments versus neurological treatments, we use unilateral manipulation. You've heard of you know, chiropractic, you may have been to a chiropractor before. For our brain-based therapy patients, we're gonna use a light force instrument, we're gonna use vibration, and we're gonna adjust just one side of the body. You know, if you have a left cerebellum, right brain, even if you hurt on the right, but it's a left cerebellar problem, then we want to adjust the left because it's gonna get that right brain firing and that right pain is gonna go away. Okay. We use oxygen therapy. We have a hand bike in here that you do oxygen therapy on. It's called EWAT, or Exercise While in Oxygen Therapy. And uh, I can tell you, I threw my back out about four months ago and you know, it really got me thinking, I mean, again, I've been treating this way for years, uh, using brain-based therapies and metabolic treatments and dealing with that as a patient, you know, it's obviously, well, okay, what's gonna work for me, right? And uh, I looked at the muscle relaxers that my doctor gave me. I said, you know what, I had to take it. I was in immense pain, and it gave me some relief. But I looked at it, and I said, well, what are they working on? And you know what? They don't work on the muscles. You know this. They work on the cerebellum, the brain. And when they affect the brain, I said, well, you know what? Let me do something else that affects the brain instead. I put a back brace on. I put, I put an ice pack in my back. And I sat down in my chair, and I did exercise therapy for an hour and a half. And I got up, and I took the back brace off, and I felt great for about six hours without any drug at all. I did it again the next day, and I was good ever since. I mean, I cannot emphasize enough how much our brain controls everything in our body. And we use this therapy. We use things like vibration. We use things like spinal decompression therapy, which is great for disc injuries to people who have a neck or back problem, but it's also really good to get your nervous system firing. We use things like infrared light therapy, which helps improve the mitochondria in your cells, gives you energy. It heals nerve damage. We have this machine right here that helps with neuromuscular re-education, getting your brain firing to the muscles better. We do spin therapy, interactive metronome, eye exams, eye exercises, all these different things that are designed to stimulate your brain the right way. You know, it's not like, you know, a typical get adjusted and then that's it. You know, it's, what we're doing is to get your body firing, your brain firing, so it can get the gut working properly. Now, when we talk about Crohn's disease, it's an inflammatory disease. Ulcerative colitis is also an inflammatory disease, okay? Diverticulitis is an inflammation of the diverticula. So when we talk about inflammation, it's important. With Crohn's, it can cause ulcers, scar tissue, fistulas, you know, you can have those from the mouth to the anus. I mean, it can be really bad. You can have, you know, it's a higher incidence among smokers. You can see, uh, you know, people are on steroids for treatment. Um, you know, diagnosis again, uh, colonoscopy, somebody said, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so you can diagnose it from a colonoscopy or biopsy, but again, what that colonoscopy is looking for is, do you have inflammation? Do you have, you know, inflammation in the gut? It's not looking for where it's coming from. It's looking to see if it's there. And that is a huge, huge distinction. I had a friend of mine in college who had Crohn's disease. I knew nothing about it at that point, other than he was on steroids his whole life and he had, you know, the stretch marks because of it. He was a skinny guy and it was just, and, and he, there are times he couldn't even walk, you know, a quarter mile. It was really, really bad. And what I've learned since then is Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease. Your immune system is attacking your gut. So when that happens, sometimes your immune system works a little better and you feel good, you're in remission. Sometimes it's worse and it gets exacerbated. It's very similar to IBS, except for the fact that you're gonna have inflammation, you know, a little differently. You're gonna have the eye involved. 
you're going to see, you know, spinal arthritis. You're going to see inflammation of the joints and tendons. Skin nodules, ulcers are going to be there. Blood clots. Anemia is going to be a lot worse than IBS. And you're going to see it associated with things like neuropathy, strokes, headaches, depression. The reason it associates with that, again, is that gut-brain connection. As the gut is inflamed, it's causing the brain to break down and get inflamed. So again, Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease. When you have an autoimmune disease, that means your immune system is mistakenly attacking your body. Other autoimmune diseases, we talked about Hashimoto's a little bit. It's the number one autoimmune disease diagnosed in our country. It affects some 27 million women in our country. And it's the most common cause of hypothyroidism. Graves' disease is hyperthyroid autoimmune disease. How about lupus? You know, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, pernicious anemia. That's a good one because I see a lot of times with thyroid dysfunction, pernicious anemia is associated with it. And what that is is it's an immune attack on your gut, on the cells that specifically make vitamin B12. So if you have fatigue and your B12 levels are low and you have this anemia going on, you should look for intrinsic factor antibodies. You want to look and see, do you have pernicious anemia? Because if you do, taking B12 isn't going to sol solve it. You have to fix the immune problem. In this country, 20% of Americans are autoimmune. Everybody, you know, one-fifth have some sort of autoimmune disease. And most people do not know it. I mean, the majority of patients that we see in this office who come in who have thyroid disease, diabetes, fibromyalgia, they have no clue. They've had all these tests done and everything looked good and they never ran antibody tests. Or what's worse, <coughs> excuse me, is they'll run a test for arthritis, for rheumatoid, for SLE, for mono, for Epstein-Barr, all these antibody tests, right? And they come back, some of them come back positive, and they say, all right, well, you're fine. We don't know what's wrong with you. You know, and it's, it's, but, but I look at the results, and it's, wait, you're autoimmune. That's where your problems are coming from. So, I mean, if we look at Crohn's disease, does the patient with Crohn's disease have one of these other autoimmune diseases? Again, from a medical management point of view, if you're autoimmune, specifically with gut dysfunction, they're going to use corticosteroids, prednisone. And they're going to try to calm down the immune system, squash it, prevent it, you know, forget calm down, just, just step on it, forget it from doing anything. And then if it gets bad enough, they're going to cut your bowel. They're going to cut out a piece of your intestine, remove the part that's affected, and then you know what happens? The condition continues because it wasn't addressed, and the next part has to be cut out. When we look at a natural metabolic treatment approach to autoimmune gut disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, we're talking about removed triggers to the immune system. What's causing your immune system to break down? What's causing, you know, are those infections, stressors? What is it that's causing your immune system to attack itself? And then once we remove it and calm it down, we need to balance it. You know, we have two halves to our immune system, Th1 and Th2. And you may be Th1 dominant, you may be Th2 dominant. And what that means basically is a normal healthy person, if you get sick, your immune system is going to shift, it's going to fight that infection, and it's going to calm back down. In an autoimmune patient, it shifts and it stays shifted. Something is driving that dominance and it will not calm down. So we have to figure out what side of the coin are you. Are you Th1 or Th2? And we have to, okay, if you're Th2, you know what? Coffee could be making you worse. Green tea extract, which you think is good for you, because you heard about it and it's a, it's a supplement, could be making you worse because it's a TH2 stimulant. How about if you're TH1 stimulant, uh, dominant, which the majority of Hashimoto's patients are, 70%, garlic could be bad for you. How about vitamin C and echinacea, which we think are good for a cold, but they're going to make your TH1 dominance worse. So you got to be careful. You need to know what your immune system is doing because you could be taking something that you think is helping you. And again, I see patients that come in that are on 25 supplements. Half of them are one you know, stimulating Th1, half of them are stimulating Th2, and everybody is, is breaking down as a result. You know, nothing, it, you're not getting better because your body's counteracting itself. By correcting the damage on the gut and the brain, we're able to see that Crohn's disease improve itself. You know, and, and again, we see that gut-brain connection. With autoimmunity, again, the biggest triggers that we look at are food intolerances, okay? You may never have had a gluten issue until a stressor turned that gene on. It could have been when you were 70 years old. Okay, that can happen. You know, you had the gene, but it was dormant. And then it became an issue. And you know what? Going gluten-free, even at that age, can completely, it's, well, I ate wheat my whole life. You know, why didn't it affect me? Because you weren't sick then. 
you know, and your body switched, and then you got sick. So removing those intolerances are key. The big ones are gluten, dairy, and soy. Secondary, I see egg, I see corn, I see coffee in some people, especially if we talk about the cross-reactivity where people it associates as gluten. Common trigger to autoimmunity, smoking, infections. How about blood sugar issues? That's a big priority. <coughs> Same with anemia. Adrenal glands, you know, hormone imbalances. And how about inflammation? Now, <coughs> we've all heard of fish oil. The good part of fish oil is your omega-3 fatty acids. If you ever see a product that says omega-369, don't buy it. If it says omega-6, don't buy it, okay? Inflammation, when we talk about you know, uh, essential fatty acids and how inflammation uh, works, it's the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. And you want to be omega-3 dominant. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, potato chips are 50 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3. White potatoes are 5 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. Well, obviously, white potatoes are going to be better than potato chips. Salmon is 1 to 12. It's 12 omega-3s every omega-6. So it's a very good food for you. Same as like flaxseed, other fish. I mean, so we talk about you always want to do what you can diet-wise to have less inflammation in your diet. And, you know, again, taking fish oil can help. Taking flaxseeds can help to help make sure that ratio stays the right direction. Because you brought this up twice, the smoking. Mm -hmm. Could that, because that's, if, well, let me, let me go back. If you are not a smoker, but you, it's environmentally, it's around you secondhand, whether it be your job, whatever, is that also a trigger? Yeah. Well, I mean, they've said, yeah, secondhand smoke is worse for you than, than primary smoke, they've okay. said. I mean, yeah, absolutely, so yeah. Would that also cause a, I guess once you hit remission, would that also cause you to, to have another episode? What I can tell you is patients that I treat who we get to a level where they are healthy, they are in remission, whether it's IBS or other autoimmune diseases, stressors can trigger and cause it to wake back up. Smoking could be a stressor. So, yeah, depending on the individual patient, that could be enough to drive them over. Um, you know, go out drinking one night, and that could be enough to turn, them, turn everything back on again eat the wrong food. How about, you know, you have, you know, somebody dies in your family or you have a big breakup, something happens. Those stressors can trigger you and cause that reaction to come back. So yeah, absolutely. All right. So how do you know if you have these triggers? Again, testing, right? We're talking about proper testing, complete blood work using our functional ranges, hormone testing, adrenal testing, looking through saliva, stool testing for infections, using metametrics, leaky gut syndrome and food sensitivities using Cerex labs. Probably none of you have had these tests done. You know, these tests are functional. They're the best tests that are out there. There are a couple of doctors locally that use them. I've got a couple of MDs in the area that use Diagnostex, which does our saliva testing, but they don't know how to interpret it. They get the test, they say here, you know, and they try to put people on 20 supplements, but that's not the solution. The solution is to figure out, you know, again, what mechanism is causing your dysfunction. What we don't want to do is, you know, say, hey, you know, go on these 20 supplements instead of taking this one medicine. That's called green medicine. And it's basically supplementing supplements, you're using supplements instead of a pill, but the treatment goal is the same. What we want to do is find out why your body isn't working right. You know, again, the example of cholesterol. Well, okay, you can take a statin or you can figure out if it's gut, blood sugar, thyroid, or immune related and work to fix those priorities and see your cholesterol levels normalize. You know, you always want to get to the underlying cause. How about low estrogen, PCOS, infertility, menopause, okay? You can take estrogen as a hormone, or you can improve your estrogen receptor site function by working on, you know, the receptors, which, is, which we can do utilizing some supplements, and get your blood sugar fixed. And how about cortisol, DHEA? So, again, it, it's all about, you know, support the symptoms or fix the problem. And, again, with, with the immune system, the tools that we use, vitamin D is a huge, huge tool. And a lot of people who have autoimmune dysfunction don't use vitamin D properly. I don't mean taking it and, and knowing how to, but I mean the dosing that you use. Because what happens is when you're autoimmune, your body doesn't absorb it right. And that's, you know, for gut problems, that's, that's pretty common. But with the D, the problem with that is if it doesn't absorb it, it gets stored and it can lead to a toxicity. And then you're dealing with hypercalcemia, and kidney stones, and all sorts of problems can develop out of that. Glutathione. Very, very powerful antioxidant. It's made in the liver. When we hit 20, age 20, it starts dropping down. 
You know, we use phosphatidylserine, which helps the pituitary gland work better. We use fish oil, so omega-3 fatty acids specifically. Nitric oxide, um, actually we use a product called Nitric Balance that has things like ATP in it, actual, literally energy. You think about it, ATP is the energy for our cells, but it decreases inflammation and it gets your immune system firing the right way. It balances the immune system out. And then if you have leaky gut, we have a product called Repairvite. You can Google this, there's a lot of stuff out there. It has all these ingredients in it, L-glutamine, deglycerinated licorice root, slippery elm, aloe vera, marshmallow extract. All these ingredients have been proven to heal the gut lining. It does a remarkable, remarkable job of that. It's just a powder, it's really easy to take. It tastes kind of like coffee. Some people like it better than others. But it really does a good job at healing leaky gut. We use a probiotic if need be. We use digestive enzymes until we get the gut to function normally. You know, so again, if you have Crohn's disease, from a neurological point of view, it's an autoimmune disease. And if we use neurological treatments, if we identify where your brain is not working, we can support it, we can get the brain firing the right way. In my office, what makes me different from all the other doctors that you've seen is we treat our patients both metabolically and neurologically. You know, we run the tests so we can really tell you we leave no stone unturned. We figure out why you have your dysfunction. Are you autoimmune? If you are, why is your immune system not working right? What is causing it to break down? The testing that we have available gives us those answers. And then we work to support and correct it naturally. You know, we're not just here to cover it up. I'm not here to say, take 30 supplements and I'll see you in a few months. You know, it's targeted nutritional supplementation. Good pill management. What that means is you may be on a cream, a liquid, and maybe two pills. You know, we're not going to use everything you know, under the sun. We're going to use targeted supplements to treat what we have to treat to get your whole body supported the right way. So what's next? What we do in my office is... We have a two-visit process for new patients. You know, all of my metabolic patients, we go through a very, very thorough evaluation. We've talked about the gut-brain connection. We do a neurological examination. I look at how your brain is firing. And we look to see, do you have a right cerebellum problem? Do you have a left parietal lobe problem? Where is the dysfunction? And that's important because it tells us how to fix it. When I can find out where that dysfunction is, we know what to do with it. How do you do that? I can show it. Who wants, Jim, come on. Come here, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you an example of one. I want you to um, slide your shoes off if you don't mind. Okay. I'm gonna pick on him because he's a patient of mine. <laughs> Give you an example of a test called Facuda's 50 step test. It's a very basic test that looks for cerebellar and uh, parietal lobe function. And uh, you know, again, we do about 11 tests. The concept that comes to mind is a field sobriety test, okay? Why do police officers do a field sobriety test? Because they wanna see if your brain isn't functioning because you're intoxicated. I'm looking to see how your brain is functioning without the alcohol. We want to know what it's really doing. What I want you to do, Jim, is I want you to close your eyes and I want you to start walking in place. Okay? You can go a little faster than that. You're good with that. So the two things we're looking for is to see if our body knows where it's supposed to be in space, okay? And number two, we're looking to see if our body rotates or not. Now, Jim, I'm gonna have you stop. If you look where you are, you're gonna look where my foot is, it's where you started. Give me a workout, sorry. I know. That's okay. A good six, a good six seven feet, okay? That, and you did not rotate at all, okay? So again, we do 10 different tests. Each test gives me a little piece of the puzzle. What that tells me right there with Jim is your cerebellum, and I know you've got balanced posture issues, so that's why I'm picking on you a little bit, but your cerebellum is not firing properly. You should be able to stand in place within two feet. If you can do that, then your cerebellum is working the way it's supposed to. Seven to eight feet and forward is not good. I mean, your brain, we gotta talk about oxygen when I see you next week. I mean, it's, it's, your brain is not firing the way it should. And, and again, we do test um, optokinetic tape, we'll do uh, uh, convergence accommodation, We'll do, um, you know, Romberg's. We'll utilize finger, finger, pass pointing. All these different tests point towards dysfunction. And again, we'll also look at grip strength. We'll look at muscle strength. Uh, the side of muscle weakness is the side of brain dysfunction. We look at blood pressure. 
Now we should have a slight difference from right to left, but if you have a big difference on one side versus the other side, that's a sign of brain dysfunction. So all these tests come together and they tell me what your body is doing. And we look for, you know, do we have a clean pattern? Do we see that brain dysfunction? And we correlate that with a sensory exam if we have neuropathy issues going on. And it tells us, again, what's your brain doing? Is it doing what it's supposed to do or not? Thank you, Jim, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When we do that first visit, that examination is really important because it helps us identify how much damage there is neurologically. And again, when we talk about the gut-brain connection, that's key. We also have a whole series of paperwork that you guys fill out that tell us what's going on with you. And if you've had labs, if you've had tests done, if you've had you know, ultrasounds or, or colonoscopies, I want those results. We review everything and we determine, hey, what's been done? Looking at metabolic assessment, you know, do you have thyroid symptoms? Do you have blood sugar symptoms? Do you have symptoms of liver disease? Do you have symptoms of hypochlorhydria in the stomach as well as IBS? Hypochlorhydria is low acid and it's a lot more common. So you think of, you know, somebody, are you taking Prevacid? Are you taking Zantac all the time because of your acid levels? Well, are you taking it because of reflux? If you are, is it because you have too much acid or too low acid? And if you have too low acid, what happens is your food can't digest and you end up getting this pain, this reflux from the food itself. I mean, that's a key thing. I, I know we've, we've talked with some of you about that in the past, and that's a key thing to look at. And there are actually markers in blood work that we can look at to see if that's something that's, coming, that's going on. Sure. I have a patient who lost, you know, he, he lost his, his throat from that. I mean, he, he has to, you know, he has, he has to talk. Yeah. So again, I've helped so many patients get off their medications, but I do it with your doctor. And the key thing is we fix what's causing it, and then we work with your doctor to wean you off the medications properly. And for most patients, we can accomplish that. Now, the goal is to, is to get it so your body doesn't reflux. Do not go off your medications on your own. You know, obviously, when you have Barrett's esophagus, it's eating away so much at the esophageal lining that we need to make sure that that acid imbalance is corrected. You know, and again, if you have an acid imbalance, you know, is it, again, what they're looking at, like a colonoscopy, an endoscopy, they're looking to see damage, and the assumption is it's coming from acid. Is it really? I mean, we don't necessarily know that yet. I mean, if, if we find well, that... Like you say, you know, your results are going to be you know, and then you're put to be like, well, you know, you have this, yeah. you take care of this, um, it is this, or they're not sure, yeah. and, you know, then you have all these other things, and, and then it's like live with it. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. You know. So here's the thing. If I find that I can help you, we sit down on visit two, and we talk about what testing I'm going to recommend. We talk about some of the areas we test for tonight. We talk about what we're going to do to help get you better. Do we need to utilize brain-based therapy or only functional medicine? And depending on what your individual case needs, somebody may need one thing or another thing. Um, I would like your spouse to be at that second visit. It's, it's uh, important when we're talking about lifestyle changes. Again, what do you eat? What's your diet? Because if we have to make changes, is it going to be done with the whole household? Is it just going to be done with you? And also, we talk about finances as well. And you know that's a key, key point. Um, I only take five new IBS Crohn's patients a month. Uh, with the amount of time that I spend with my patients. You know, again, I talked about the eight minutes with most medical doctors. My IBS patients are gonna get one to two times a month, a 30 to 45 minute one-on-one -on -one session with me. I have a nutritional coordinator that we're bringing on board finally because uh, I have a lot of questions that get asked about diet and how do I live this lifestyle that they're gonna be better able to uh, provide the time on. Uh, and I'm available by email either way. But you know, you're getting, you're getting you know, an hour to two hours of me every single month one-on-one -on -one sitting down and saying, hey, here's the labs we've run, here's what we're doing, here's the changes we're gonna make, here's the results of those changes, here's how we're gonna test, treat, and retest you to get your life back. If we do therapies, therapies may be done with me through adjustments, maybe done with my staff through therapies, everything is done based on what we have to do on exam findings. You know, what do we need for your individual case? Those first two visits normally cost $245. If you sign up today, I'll give you a discount of $100. You know, I'll offer you, you know, if you say, hey, you came to the seminar, I've taught you a lot tonight, you know, so I don't have to teach it to you again as a new patient. If you pay tonight, I will discount it to $45 for those two visits. I mean, I, you know, it's, I do want to go over one thing, though, and, and it's important that we understand, you know, the model that we're in right now, what it consists of is an acute 
care model. I'm going to hop out of this for one second and go over this. You go to the doctor, and they are looking at your chronic <coughs> gut problem as an acute problem, and they're treating it as such. They're not looking at how do we fix it, how do we correct it, what, what wellness changes can we make, what can we do lifestyle-wise in the long run. They're just looking, what can I do to give you symptom relief right now today? You know, talk about your dad, you know, the pain he's in. What can we do to give him relief right now today? Not how do we stop him from having that pain long term. I really, really believe that our insurance and in the whole Medicare, or the whole healthcare model that we're in right now is designed to keep bad doctors in business. I call it the two eyes, insurance and incompetence. And, you know, really what we're talking about is if you had to go back to your doctor, every six months, every three months, and get the exact same results that you get every single time, and your insurance didn't pay for it, would you go? Of course not. In my office, I have three rules for accepting your case. Number one, you have to be willing to make serious lifestyle changes. If we find a food sensitivity that is causing your gut to break down, you have to make that change. You know, and and it, it, it's got to be all or nothing in some cases. You know, you can't be 90% pregnant, right? And you talk about gut, uh, you talk about gluten. If you have celiac disease, it's 100%. 60% of celiacs don't know they have celiac disease. They don't have any GI symptoms at all. But you have to give it up if that's the case. You also be, you have to be accountable for your health. I'm going to hold you responsible specifically. And the unfortunate reality is you have to reach into your pockets to pay for your care. You know, I can get labs covered. A good bit, not all of them. You know, usually labs are, are still, to a certain extent, especially these specialized tests. You know, you're going to be paying out of pocket for them. But some insurance, Blue Cross, is paying for some more tests now. It's pretty neat. We're saving about $400 on, on testing for people that w normally would be out of pocket uh, for a couple of the big tests that we look at. So that's good, and, and maybe it'll spread to the other companies. But what we tell people is, you know, we try to make our care plans as affordable as possible. But you're going to be looking at 150 to 300 a month possibly for 18 to 24 months, depending on how severe your case is. And, and again, the reality is, you know, where is your priority? You know, if you think about it on a scale of 1 to 10, how serious is your illness? How has it affected your relationships, your work, you know, your ability to enjoy life? You know, if you think about how serious are you about eliminating your illness, getting rid of your gut dysfunction, you know, I want to help those that are truly committed. All these workshops that I do are a lifeline. We're throwing you a life jacket. It's up to you to swim to me. With that being how, said. How, um, you said that you work with the doctors. Mm -hmm. How well do they receive? Some really, really well. Sometimes I refer you to a doctor that I work with. Okay. I mean, it's, it's and, and, and you may know that better. You know, if, if you're asking the question, you got to think, well, what does my doctor do? I mean, it's. I, I've got some OBGYNs that I know that I work with. I love them to death. They're great as people. They are very traditionalists. If you, wanna, if you don't want to do drugs during a pregnancy, don't go to them. You know, it's just the way they are. And when you talk about some doctors are a certain way no matter what, you can't, you know, it, we should be here to work with the patients to get them better. You know, and... and, and in, my, in my experience, it's just that doctors are doctors and medicine is medicine, and that's all, that's all that they believe. What I do, and the reason why this really works is because everything that I've talked to you about tonight, everything that we do, is based on their research. It's what I'm reading. You know, again, there's a stat that um, it takes 11 years for something alternative to follow into the mainstream. If you think about uh, Lavaza, which is an omega-3 fatty acid, it's a fish oil that's now a prescription. Omega-3s have been recommended forever, and it's now available. You think about some of these things that are now on the mainstream, you know, and it, it takes so long before things become mainstream. A lot of what we're doing now, the hope is that it'll be mainstream 10 years from now. But people can't wait 10 years. You know, they're going to be too sick at that point. So what we do is we talk to the doctors in their language. I write letters. I include lab values. You know, and, and yes, functional labs, they're not going to necessarily be as familiar with. But, but if it's lab high or low, and, and I run so many more tests than they run, we're going to catch stuff, and I'm going to explain, here's what I found. Here's what me and the patient want to do. I would like you to work with me and help change this medication or do this. And most of the time, when you present it that way, yeah, they will. Or, or, or a lot of times it's, sure, whatever you want, I don't care. I don't want to get involved with it, but sure, I'll do it for you. And, and, and it's unfortunate that it's, it's hands, hands off, but usually the outcome is what we need. 
like I said, I do have a handful of doctors that I work with um, in the Lake Norman area mostly who I can refer you to, who I work very well with, um, a family physician in Mooresville, um, primary care, a big group. She sees you know a lot of regular patients, and um, she's. Who's the primary care doctor? I'm recording this, so I'm going to leave it. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. I don't want to put her name on there necessarily, but uh, but I, I can tell you after the break if you want. And she's a good doctor. Yeah, but. Uh, um, you know, again, I thank you all for coming. You know, if you have well, any other questions. In my defense, I did take my significant other shopping today, and she spent three and a half hours shopping, and it depleted my brain of oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sat and watched Jim, are you sure it wasn't you just talking? That was my excuse. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know. We could have been all the way up to <laughs>